the rest of you open up your Bibles to Genesis. soft hearts this morning. 
Lord, help us to have our, our minds conform to your will, not our will, not the will of the world, Lord, but, but what you would have for us. And in knowing the truth, Father, give us that freedom, that glorious freedom that only you can provide by knowing truth. God, if there's any lies or any deceit that, that's in our mind or in our philosophy of life, God, I just pray that you correct those this morning. And in doing so, Lord, that uh, we would live in an even more abundant freedom by your truth. We do this all by the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Here we saw the, uh, the reaction of man. How man uh, didn't come clean to God. And ultimately uh, ended up pointing the finger Pointing the finger at God, saying, well, it's your fault because you put this woman here with me. Pointing the finger at Satan. Well, Satan deceived me. That's the reason why I sinned. Or uh, not, not even taking the blame for ourselves. Blaming our culture or our world around us. But what we learned is that the scripture expects us to take ownership for our behaviors. That we cannot, we cannot point the finger at anybody else but ourselves when we sin. And so now after that engagement, we see that God hands out his judgment. He hands out the punishment for sin. After all, God is not a liar. Verse 14, he begins with the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So in the Garden of Eden, God created mankind and animals and the plants and, and the earth to all live in a, uh, a blessed situation. Uh, the, the definition, the very definition of blessed situation is to be in a situation like the Garden of Eden, where everything is good, where the lions are laying with the lambs and the moose are playing nice with the dogs and... Uh, Husband and wife are living in perfect unity. Uh, though they're distinct, their, their complementary behaviors are working together in perfect tandem. Uh, there's no uh, natural disasters that are creating havoc, but no, just a time of peace and blessedness. And so that's what God intended for mankind. But when mankind made the choice to sin, that changed. That changed. And so now we find humankind transitioning from a time of bless, blessedness to a time of cursing. Every terrible, ugly, messed up, toxic thing on earth is because of this sin event. And we're going to look at that here this morning. What does it mean to be cursed? Well, the Hebrew word arar means to curse. When God curses something or someone, it means that he has imposed judgment upon it to change the state of the relationship between that thing or that person and himself. So essentially, it's, it's a, a judgment, it's a punishment, it's, it's a change of relationship. It's like if you're on Facebook and uh, somebody makes you really mad, so you unfollow them or you unfriend them. It, it's, a, it's a fundamental changing of your relationship. And in real life, of course, it would be as if you just said, don't ever talk to me again. You are my enemy. You're not my friend. Um, it's a changing of relationship. So when God curses, he is the one who changes that relationship. To be living under the curse of God is to be living under his judgment. In Israel's national history, uh, we see in Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28, God lays out this, this blessing, uh, this promise of blessing and cursing. He says, if you do these things, if you follow my law, if you do what is good and right, then you will be blessed in all that you do. But if you do all these things, if you rebel against my law, if you sin against me, then you will not succeed in all that you do. You will be cursed. So here they were faced with that choice, just as Adam and Eve were faced with that choice. And today we're even faced with that same choice as well. That same promise of blessings and curses goes along with our obedience to the Lord. 
if we are disobedient, if we are rebellious, rebellious against the Lord, um, then that affects things a little bit, doesn't it? So the standard of blessings and curses is what judged them throughout history, is what judged people throughout history. And now that having an idea of what it means to be cursed is, God said that he cursed the serpent more than any of the other animals. Now this doesn't mean that all animals are necessarily cursed at all times. Uh, what this simply means is that God applied uh, a greater curse to the serpent than all the other animals. Because the fact is, all of us are essentially living in a cursed existence, a cursed world, because we live in a fallen world. Therefore, the animals, uh, for the most part, are cursed. Human beings, for the most part, are cursed. The, the land, for the most part. But why the serpent? Well, it makes sense that since God, or since the devil, um, he did his deceiving through the serpent, and since the serpent was involved in this activity, that God cursed the serpent. And there's two truths about this, the, that God cursed the serpent. Despite being under the influence of Satan, God still punishes or curses the serpent. And I think that's true in life. You think about um, people, for example, who abuse substance. You know, they, uh, they get drunk and they say, well, it's the drink that caused me to do that. Well, it's, it was your choice to drink, wasn't it? You cannot blame being under the influence. Ultimately, you're still held accountable for what you did. If you're driving drunk and you hit and kill a child, you are still going to be held responsible, not the drink. It's still you held responsible. It's the same thing all throughout Scripture. No matter what kind of influence somebody was under, if they committed a crime, they were still held accountable. And so it goes for the serpent. But more so even than that, because we can't necessarily say that animals um, have the same relationship with God that we do. In fact, humankind, men and women, are the only ones the Bible says were created after his likeness and his image. Uh, animals, the Bible doesn't say, say so. We know that animals can be a great blessing, they're a great joy to us, they can be like family to us, uh, they're wonderful. But just like Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, we don't know whether the soul of an animal goes up or downward. We, we really don't know. Uh, that question cannot be answered here on earth according to the Bible. It cannot be answered. Uh, our hope is hopefully that all dogs go to heaven, right? We can hope that. We can hope that our horses and, and our dogs... Uh, will be joining us in heaven. But we cannot say that with absolute certainty from Scripture. So with that in mind, why would God then curse the serpent? What's the point of that? What's the point of cursing the serpent? Well, to all mankind, for all of us, the snake or the serpent um, acts as a perpetual example and reminder of deceit, temptation, and the fall. And so when you think about this punishment that was handed out, it says, Cursed are you more than all animals, beasts of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So some like to think, um, mainly because of the book of Revelation, which refers to Satan as that, that dragon, that old dragon, that serpent, um, that perhaps before the fall, the creature of the snake was like a dragon, and it had arms, uh, and, and feet and uh, something like that. And then after the curse, then those arms and those legs were removed and it was caused then to, to be in the lowest of low position. Uh, in, in Hebrew tradition, things that were lowest to the ground and that things that were in the mud and in the dirt were considered to be some, some of the lowest creatures. And so it, it only makes sense that, that that's a possibility. But the point is, that whenever we look upon snakes or serpents, it's meant to be a symbol and a reminder of what happened in the garden. Uh, we're, we're meant to be reminded of the snake in which spoke to Eve and, and deceived. So in a lot of ways, like my wedding ring is a constant symbol and reminder of the covenant that I made with my wife, never to leave her, never to forsake her, but to stay committed no matter what. 
Um, in the same way, only the opposite way, the snake serves as a symbol and a reminder of the fact that we live in a fallen world. And the fact and the reality that there is someone known as the devil, as Satan, who deceives and who tricks. If we look through the Bible, um, the snake, which, the snake is kind of like a mascot, if you will. Okay, if Satan never had a mascot, he would be the snake. Okay, you know, rah, rah, siskumba, you know, the, the snake. Um, so when we look upon the snake, think of that. And throughout the Bible, that's brought to our attention. Genesis 49, 17 says, The tribe of Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. Matthew 23, 33, Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees of his day, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? And then also we see in Numbers 21, uh, turn with me there if you will, to Numbers 21. That is in the Old Testament, just after Leviticus. Numbers, Numbers 21. And we covered this narrative when we were in the book of John. But we're going to begin here in Numbers chapter 21, starting <coughs> verse 4. And let me put you into context here. Um, Israel had just won a great battle. They had prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, help us to win this battle against our enemies. And God responded and allowed them to win this battle against their enemies. And watch how the Israelites respond here in verse 4. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. And of course, they're talking about the provisions that God was giving them, the, the quail, the manna. We loathe this heavenly food. We want something else. We want meat. We want, we want the good kind of meat, Lord. Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. What did, what did the Lord send? Serpent. Remember the, the covenant reminder of the fall? He sent the serpent among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord, and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. Okay, we're going to stop there, but we're going to come back and look at the second half of that in a little bit. But do you see how the serpent, uh, God consistently throughout the Bible, uses the serpent as a reminder of sin. And the same is true today. I mean, we look at the behaviors of the snake, uh, just its craftiness, uh, its hunting, the way it hunts, the way it slithers, you know, just, it makes sense that this is the animal that is the mascot of Satan. So because of the association of the snake at the time of Satan's deceit, God then decided to Curse the snake so that it would forever symbolize and remind us of sin. Okay, so that's the point of that. Um, <clears throat> when I was trying to decide how to uh, how to plan out the next couple weeks and how we're going to cover these verses, um, my philosophy in studying and in teaching and preaching is to do all the studying work uh, by myself, all the exegesis, just me and the Bible, maybe a Bible dictionary. But I don't look at the commentaries, I don't listen to sermons or anything like that until the very, very end, until it's all done. And I found this to be a very useful thing because it helps me to know if, if I'm on track or not with my studies. Um, I have a, a handful, about five or six different pastors that I trust that I know are, are proven Bible scholars and, and studiers and teachers, uh, one of which is uh, John MacArthur. 
Uh, many of you might know who he is. And if you think my sermons are long, his go about an hour and a half, uh, sometimes even two hours, so be thankful. <laughs> um, but I, he, the way that he broke these up, uh, verses 14 and 15, he took two weeks to do verses 14 and 15. He talked one week just about the curse upon the snake itself, and then the next week he talked about uh, verse 15. And I thought for the sake of the content, and um, just for the sake of our own sanity, I thought we would put these together uh, just because it's a nice, <coughs> nice little flow. But if you want to look into more information about um, the, the symbolism of the snake, then uh, I'd encourage you to do so. But the reason why I wait till the very end to listen um, to some of these sermons is because I, I, I like to, I like to know if, if I'm on track or not. And it's the coolest thing in the world when. When you're listening to another preacher, and he basically comes up with the exact same points. Uh, totally separate studies, but yet we come to the same point. And let me just remind you, that's the, the exact reason why we must make the Bible our only infallible rule of faith and practice. Because if we're all studying it correctly, then whether we're here, or whether we're in John MacArthur's church, or whether we're down the street at, at Christ Church, or at the Vine Church, or any of our other close brothers and sisters here in the area, then we should all be believing the same thing, shouldn't we? We should all, for the most part, be coming to the same conclusions. And that's why the Bible is so important. When we start just coming up with our own ideas and, and injecting those into the Bible, then we're going to have diversity, then we're going to have division, uh, then we're going to have false teaching. But the Bible brings unity in a Christian church. And so we're going to look at verse 15 here, and we're going to continue through this. Uh, I, I, could, I could literally spend probably uh, a good month or two just in these two verses. They're, they're that crucial. But for the sake of time, we'll, we will spend only today in verse 15. <clears throat> verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, or crush you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So we looked at how God cursed the serpent, and now we're going to get how he puts a curse on Satan himself, which in effect is also a curse on mankind. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll look at how God specifically curses uh, the woman, and then how God specifically curses the man. But today we're going to look at the, just mankind in general, the enmity that exists between us and Satan. Our worldview should be that of living in a world that is, is full of the fallout of sin. Uh, if, if you lived back in the, the early uh, 40s or 50s, then probably when you were in school, you had to do the, the nuclear training, right? You, you were in class, and you had to get under your desk, or people were building fallout shelters. People are still doing stuff like that, building fallout shelters. Because if a nuclear bomb came and dropped, then there would be nuclear fallout for, I, I don't know, uh, how many hundreds of years or thousands of, I, I forget the figure. But the idea is that after a fallout, things are different. Things drastically change. And so we need to view our world as we're living in a world that is fallen out from sin. Um, there are things that just aren't the way they used to be in the Garden of Eden. And this is because of the curse that God put upon man, upon the world. There is a perpetual enmity between good and evil going on. And we feel it, don't we? Uh, we look, we see that in nature, don't we? We see catastroph catastrophic events, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, uh, mudslides, uh, you name it. There are these catastrophic events that not only damage um, things that we build or our lives, but they also kill people. We see that all the time. Um, they're still recovering from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the East Coast, you know, they get a couple inches of snow. That's a great tragedy to them. Uh, we know how to deal with it here. But if we get a windstorm here that knocks our power out for a whole week, I mean, that's pretty catastrophic to us. It can be. Uh, it even caused a few deaths. Trees fell on cars, killed people. We see it in nature. But then we also see the good side of nature, don't we? Uh, 
Uh, anybody like to snowboard, ski, uh, go play in the ocean? I know Elizabeth uh, Goodner just got back with Kelsey Carlson. They went to the Hawaiian Islands and they were having a great time. Um, going to Hawaii myself was just wonderful. Just playing in the ocean. I mean, there was blessing in that. It was, it was really good. There are blessings in nature, but there are curses in nature. And there's this constant enmity between the good in nature and the cursed in nature. It's just a constant tug of war. We also see this play out um, in the animals. And look at the animal kingdom. We have some animals that are, that are pets that are such a blessing. And then we have some animals that are predators and are nuisances. I know there's a group that's going to go up and do a wolf hunt or something uh, sometime here soon. Because they can be a nuisance, right? Uh, in, in our own backyard, last night, if you're a Facebook friend of ours, you've probably seen the videos, but that moose that's been hanging out by the Arcadia uh, this whole last week, with the tag in its ear and everything, um, Amy and I were watching TV last night, and all of a sudden Amy says, uh, there's a moose in our front yard. <laughs> so we, we go to the window and we look, and sure enough, there's this moose with the tag in its ear, just eating our tree. Um, and it's, it's the weirdest thing to be living in a city like that, and all of a sudden a moose is just in your front yard. Um, and so we were blessed by that. We were really enjoying that. You know, I, we don't really care about that tree, so we, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we don't want to take drops in the front yard. Uh, but then, suddenly we saw the flip side of it, because the next thing we knew, that moose uh, stepped over our neighbor's backyard fence and was in the backyard. Well, our neighbor has three dogs, one little yapper and a couple of uh, big dogs running around back there. And uh, we're, we're just sitting back there just knowing that the dog is the mortal enemy of the moose uh, in a lot of cases. And sure enough, the little yapper, thinking he's like 10 feet tall, comes running up to the moose, just yelling at it, biting out its ankles, and the big dogs are kind of huddled in the back. <laughs> and, the see the dogs. and then the moose just starts charging these dogs. And we hear some of the dogs start yelping and, and crying, and we're thinking, oh, the moose is killing these dogs. Uh, so suddenly, what was, what, what was a blessing and just an enjoyment to, to view, suddenly became uh, a, a time of catastrophe. And, but thankfully, I went over and knocked on the, the neighbor's door, and I said, do you hear your dogs dark, barking? There's a, a moose in your backyard killing them. And, uh, <laughs> He's like, oh, I was wondering why they were getting so excited. Yeah. <laughs> so he ended up going back. He got the dogs in. Um, thankfully, none of them were hurt. The moose just ate off of his trees for a while and then eventually went walking out. If you, if you want to see the videos, we have a few videos on, on our Facebook page. Um, unless you have decided to uh, curse us and unfriend us. <laughs> then you can't see it. So we see that struggle happening in nature as well. Uh, we see the, the lion pursuing the lamb. Uh, we see you know, bears even killing people who think it's a smart idea to live among them uh, because they can be friendly. We see them suddenly turn and eat them. Uh, but we see the good side as well. And this is all part of that, that curse, just that, that unknowability. You know, you don't know whether a dog's going to suddenly turn on you and you. You don't know for a fact. Um, you look at the, the circus trainers. You don't know if the lion's going to turn into maul you, even though for years it didn't. We watched a documentary uh, last night called Black Fish about uh, the orca whales that are in captivity. And these trainers train with them and have successful shows all the time. And then the next thing you know, it turns around and eats them. Uh, this happens. Why is that? It's because of the curse of this tug of war of, of good and evil, that unpredictability of nature. We see this happen in all, all aspects of life, on, on a national level. You know, we see nations rise up against nations. It could be the littlest thing that sets off a nation and causes war. Uh, we've seen the hell of war happen in life. Um, I'm thankful enough to never have been a part of any kind of warfare. Um, but it is for real. And we also see peace as well. We see peace between nations, you know, sharing of trade, um, vacationing, you know, the ability to travel to Europe, for example, and, and enjoy uh, all the fruits of Europe. Um, you probably at this point would not go to Iran 
and enjoy their fruits because it's a time of war. And you also think about the personal struggles as well. Uh, in fact, we're seeing a personal struggle play out right in front of us here. Um, if you don't know, Rachel struggles with, with seizures and, and great issues with that. She has for years, and all that is due to the curse. And we prayed and prayed and prayed with her and for her, yet they continue. She's, she's done just about everything you can medically do. Um, and still she struggles. And, but we're going to keep praying. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep trying to help. And why don't we do that in this hour? Let's, let's pr pray for Rachel. Father in heaven, uh, we just want to pray right now for our sister Rachel Lindsay, who is experiencing a, an episode at the moment. God, we don't know why specifically this is happening to her. Uh, we don't know why you haven't healed her yet. We can't answer that. We're just, we're men. But, Lord, you know, and, and we know that the reason why it's happening is because of sin, uh, ultimately. But, God, it, it's our prayer, it's our request that if it's possible that at least in this hour, God, that you give her peace. You would just... You just wash over her in this hour, Father, according to your will. God, just, just calm her heart. Calm her mind, Lord. Just help her focus. Give her peace, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. But then we also notice that there are blessings, too. You know, we all have aches and pains and troubles and diseases and things we're dealing with. Uh, yesterday, uh, little Sienna, you all know Sienna, she's, she's a little fireball, she runs around, she's just, you know, really cute, really smart, uh, she's happy most of the time, but yesterday she puked all day long, all day long, from the time we woke up, till the time we went to bed, till the time we woke up again this morning, uh, finding that Sophia had been a little sweetheart and tried to clean up the puke and, and help her ended up making a bigger mess. <laughs> but um, that happens. You know, we, we all go through these things, don't we? I mean, how many of us have trick knees or you know, issues with our back or whatever else it might be? But then we also have times where we feel really good. You know, our health feels really good. We feel real vibrant. And, and life is good. And the point of this is that this is meant to, to demonstrate to us that we live in a fallen world. Things are not getting better. You know, things are just going up and down. We have good times, we have bad times. We have good times, we have bad times. And that's the nature of living in a cursed world. On a spiritual level, Paul explains this perfectly. I don't even need to uh, commentate on it. Uh, the personal struggle that we have between sin and righteousness in our life, doing what's right versus doing what's wrong. Paul says in Romans 7, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man am I. I mean, is that like a, a Gollum scenario or what? <laughs> just a guy just debating his, his new nature in Christ, debating with his old nature in sin. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we're in our right mind, we're like, I want to do what's right. I want to set up all these barriers to do what's right. Man, this... My precious just keeps calling to me. You know, it's that way. We have this inner conflict, this inner struggle. 
So we see that as it is in nature, as it is between nations, as it is in our health, in, in our, just our physical uh, ability, as it is in our spiritual struggle, all of those things are the result of sin and the result of living in a cursed reality. And my friends, that has to be our worldview because that's what the Bible teaches. There are some people who think that somehow we can, uh, through an, an evolutionary process, become supreme beings ourselves. And how we can somehow heal this land all on our own accord. How we can somehow just make everything right. We, we can somehow put the lion with the lamb for a photo opportunity. Well, you might get a good picture, but uh, take a picture in about 20 minutes and you'll see the carnage and the blood on the lion's face. Because the way it is now is we're, we're in a cursed reality. Everything is in enmity. And this is why God tells us not to love the world. This is why he says, do not love the world. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Why? Because the world is passing away. Deuteronomy 28.20 20 also says, Curses, confusions, and frustration until you are destroyed and perish. My friends, the fact is, all that is cursed will perish. And spiritually speaking, not only in this life, but in the life to come. All that remains cursed will ultimately die. Consider the words of Jesus, who says to those who he would identify as the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment. What is cursed will perish. So should I just end it there? Should we just stop there and say, well, that's the end of the story. We live in a cursed reality. You're going to have good times. You're going to have bad times. The reason is because Adam and Eve decided to sin, and we all inherited the sin, and we're all sinners. And So just enjoy your life when you can, but man, when it's down, just remember the curse. <laughs> Should that be the end of it? No. Our worldview <laughs> as Christians rests on the fact that we have a Redeemer. We have a Savior. We have one who blesses and saves and lifts the curse from our life. Amen? Amen? That's why we're here. Because we believe that. If you look here at the language in verse 15, God talks about uh, having uh, enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your, heel, uh, your head, you he shall bruise his heel. The seed that it's talking about here uh, is twofold. It's referring specifically to the seed that would bring about the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, through Mary, the virgin birth, it goes through all the, the patriarchs and the line of David. Uh, that seed is what it's talking about. But it's also talking about all those who live and behave as children of God, those who are seeds of Jesus Christ, children of God. And specifically, the seed, of course, is Jesus. There is no other answer, according to the Bible. There is no other answer. The one who bruises the head of Satan is Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. And to that, I turn to my Jewish friends and say, open your eyes. Jesus is the fulfillment of Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is the Mashiach, the Messiah. Jesus is the one who has defeated sin and death. And there's a billion verses. There's a billion verses I could go over. I believe John MacArthur did that. I'm just going to do three. Uh, for the sake of time, we do have communion and we do have um, potluck to attend to. So here are three very powerful verses that prove the fact that Jesus fulfilled this. For example, Old Testament foreshadowing, uh, John 3, 14 through 15, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What's the reference there? Do you remember Numbers 21? Is your Bible still there, maybe? Go back to Numbers 21. Okay, so if you remember, uh, Israel was complaining against God, right? Uh, and they, they were complaining against Moses. And God sent, what, serpents to come and bite them, to which some of them died. Many of them were still poisoned. And they said, Moses, uh, intercede for us so that we might live. We have sinned, we confess that, and we want to live. Okay, so pick it up here in verse 7. It says, and Moses interceded for the people. So he decided to do that. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. <coughs> okay, so let me just paint this picture for you. So God expected the people of Israel who were bitten by the curse, which was the snake, to then look upon the curse for healing. Does that make any sense? Okay, we're going to look upon an image of the curse to be healed. Okay, and many of us know that, uh, um, that salvation comes by faith, right? Obviously, it requires faith to be like, all right, well, if that's the remedy, then that's what I'm going to do. So, I mean, it, it didn't matter what it really was. God could have said, well, you know what, why don't you just uh, uh, go take a chicken and uh, dance around with it, do the macarena with it for about five minutes, and then he'll be healed. It could have been that. And you could demonstrate your faith by doing that. But God is much deeper and much wiser than any of us, and he chose, he specifically chose the serpent for a reason. And this was all foreshadowed. Follow me into the uh, crucifixion. Um, Mark 15, 33-34 says, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to its mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. So here Jesus said that the Son of Man must be lifted up. And what happened? The Son of Man was lifted up. And he not only said it must be lifted up, but he said it must be lifted up like the staff, like Moses' staff in the wilderness. Now why would that be a comparison? I think many of you probably know, but let's look at it anyway. Why would that be a comparison? Let's look at Galatians 3, 10 through 14, which says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Jesus became the curse. It says it right here in the scripture. And, and what's that referring to? It, it's the, the looking back, it's the reflection upon Moses and the staff and the very thing which was the curse becoming the, the very thing that healed them. Jesus himself became the curse so that if we look to him, look upon him for salvation, we will be saved. If we don't look upon him, we will remain cursed, and we will die, and we will perish. Many people have asked throughout history, why does Jesus in the moment where he's on the cross say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken it? It just doesn't make sense. Why would he say that? Well, the answer is simply, in this moment, he became the curse. He became the and he died so that we could look upon him and that we could be saved. In closing, what does that make you and I here in this cursed world? Yes, we have our Savior. 
Yes, that's great. But how does that play out in this world? What does that mean to us? Um, it means that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are ambassadors of the one who became the curse and died for us. We are ambassadors of the one who brings blessing to this life. The only thing that can truly bless this cursed world. And that makes us his children. And that makes us his seed. Going back to verse 15. Consider 1 John 3, 7 through 10. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So you want to bless this cursed world? Then you go out and you practice righteousness. You go out and you be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You go out and share with your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers about the love of Jesus Christ. And not only share it verbally, but share it with your life. Be a blessing. Be a pocket of blessing in this cursed world. But also expect to know that tragedy is going to happen. I mean, we, we can't avoid it. You know, I, my heart really just breaks for this, uh, this couple here in Washington whose two-year-old child somehow wandered out of the house and they went searching for the child and they found the child drowned in a, in a crate nearby. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. How, how do you explain something like that? Well, the Bible tells us exactly why things like that happen, even to good, righteous people. Because we still live in a cursed world. And the only time that's going to change is when the Lord returns, when He takes us home, uh, when He finally uh, throws Satan and his followers uh, in, into the lake of fire, and when the new heavens and the new earth come, and we finally live in that blessedness all the time, every day, where the lion lays down with the lamb, where the moose plays nice with the dogs, <laughs> where husband and wife get along well, um, and complement each other well and, and work together where there's no more battle of the sexes where there's no more your country versus my country where there's no more your football team versus my football team <laughs> where we're all one in Christ Jesus let's pray Father thank you for your word thank you for its truth its clarity it truly does make us free right? Just simply by understanding the world around us and how it came to be, and understanding how it can be made right again, there's so much freedom in my soul because of that. God, I just pray that you would help us to be good ambassadors for you, that we can share your gospel message to the world, that when people come asking questions about difficult things that happen in life, that we can not only love them and comfort them, but when the time is right, provide them with correct theological answer, and hopefully in their soul they can be free too. Uh, God, we just pray for you to come. It's our heart, come Lord Jesus. Uh, we're going to still try every single day to do what's right. We're going to battle within ourselves. We're going to battle within um, between good and evil, but God, I just pray that you come. That's our ultimate heart's desire. And as we remember your son Jesus and what he did in this hour, Lord, I just I pray that you'll smile upon us. And you'll carry us through this next week here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.